Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny Beattie, and former France international, Benjamin Kayser. We've got a big time guest coming up as well, and we'll look ahead to the return of the Champions Cup and take a look at what's been going on in the top 14 recently. But first, it does feel like ages ago, but happy new year, guys. How was your festive period? Happy new year. Happy new year, boys. Bonne année. Bonne année. La santé, la santé, la santé. That means health, health, health. And the rest, you can all sort it yourselves. Health, Johnny? <laughs> well, I'll let, I'll let Kayser go first. Benji, how was your new year, mate? Come on. Did you have a good one? Uh, well, cr- Christmas and New Year's was pretty much both the same. Everybody had at COVID at some point. So my, my, my wife yeah. got it Christmas Eve. So we were on our way to the in-laws, had to turn around, pretend the girls, no, no, we got it wrong. You know, Christmas is next week, actually. We just completely got it wrong. <laughs> Pouring the eyes out in, in the car. Yeah, don't let us, you know, we want to go see grandma and stuff. So th- that was that was a bit brutal. Harsh. Some And so my eldest got it, but for some reason, my little one and myself never did. It's because we're just absolute bloody machines. <laughs> the, torpedo, the torpedo in myself. Which means I built on for breakfast because that's what pretty much that's what she eats since she's four. I can't be, I could not be prouder. Um, saves you. That, that's the, uh, there you go. I'll, I'll get you the the special trick against COVID. Built on. But um, no, no. So so that was a bit brutal. And then New Year's Day though. So we did Christmas. We did sort of a Christmas lunch on New Year's Day, which was uh, which was lovely. But um, I, don't, I told you guys a fair few times. My sister was getting married. Wedding got canned. So I don't want to speak about Christmas anymore. This whole this whole couple of weeks, oh, everybody's okay. My girls are okay. They still got some gifts. We still, you know, had a nice time and stuff. But the frustration of missing out on so many things, so many reunions. I haven't seen my parents for months now. It's just getting heavy. It's getting really, really heavy. So, so want to move on. And twenty two is going to be smashing. Twenty twenty two is going to be absolutely amazing. Uh, we're going to see each other, lick each other's faces. Everybody's going to be able to travel. <laughs> Rugby is going to be full tilt. I can't wait. Johnny, similar story your end? Uh, I think I've done too much of licking faces already, mate. That's my issue at the minute. And I need to eat biltong for breakfast, clearly. Um, we're riddled here, mate, at the minute. So today's actually my first day testing negative. Um, and I have been in a pickle <laughs> for the past week. Um, I think like you, Benji, as well, we spent so much time dodging it and moving around. So we actually had a really nice Christmas at home. We were back in Scotland. Um, and then we had a wedding over New Year, which was the kiss of death in Ireland. So went to County Clare, went to Doolin in Ireland, had an amazing time. But I think halfway through the wedding, everyone was like, there's absolutely no chance we can get home from this thing, which we had to. We had to test negative to get home. We had to test negative to get back to France. Um, so well within the rules, but we arrived on French soil and my wife and I just looked at each other and we we're like, something is not right. Um, mm. And that was it. So we had three, four days grim like everyone else has had. It's not like we've been flat out in bed, but horrible throats, horrible heads, sore all over. Um, and that's us just finished day seven of quarantine. Um, we've just all tested again and we've just found out that our eldest Lockie is positive for the first time. So we've got another seven days um, to go. But do you know what? It was, it was worth it. Like you said, Benji, just that little bit to see family. It was worth it to get back, see everybody. I think that 2022, like you said, the light is finally at the end of the tunnel. The sort of the way governments are speaking, people are saying, look, we have to get on with this now. So hopefully rules and regulations will be lighter and we can get out and do more and see more lick each other's faces, do what you want, Benji. Hopefully it's just around the corner. So that's us at the minute. It was a good Christmas. It's been a, a dodgy start to 2022, um, but looking forward to the next few weeks, some massive games of rugby, uh, six nations just around the corner um, and all looking positive. Do we need a built on supplier, Benji? Do we, it feels like I, that, that would be, that, that would be absolutely lovely actually. And there's a big old strong South African, uh, what's, well, South African slash Scottish prop in Edinburgh who does some delicious biltong and he's been kind he enough does. to like, you know, pay one, throw one, something like that. That's, that's ideal. But if he wants to throw more this way, please, I'll pick them up and I'll be happy to. It's the only biltong that's basically like a sirloin steak sliced in like three pieces. <laughs> grilled. I mean, the amount of meat that they are, they're very, very chunky, absolutely delicious. Couldn't, uh, what's it called again? Uh, Johnny, might as well give him a it, it's, it's Pierre Schumann. It's Pierre Schumann. So if you go on his know, social media, he does yeah. really, really good. I think it's called the proper, proper pioneer. Yeah, proper it's pioneer. Proper. It's a play yeah. very clever. It's a front row play on words. Delicious. It's very, very clever. And um, the other one that's actually really good is Armand Coster, who I, another boy who was at the Cheetahs. I played with him at Bayonne. He's got the Zulu Shack, 
which he set up in France as well. So if you're back in the UK, you can use Schumann's. And if you're in France, you can look up the Zulu Shack or Armand Costa's Instagram. There's a plug for both of them. You should get commission for this, Benji, but they do some seriously good built on its next level. The chili one, the chili built on it's the best. It's out of this world. This is incredible. Pierre, Armand, first week for free, but give us a call next week. <laughs> exactly. We're charging you. <laughs> Should we have a chat about the top 14 then? Because there were three rounds over the festive period, a number of games cancelled, but still a load did go ahead. So where are we at? It wasn't a good period for Beerits, was it, Johnny? Uh, yeah, Yes and no. Um, I think if you're looking purely at wins and losses, it's obviously not great, but the manner of those losses weren't catastrophic. Um, and they'll take confidence from that. But they lost that sort of basement battle game against Perpignan at the weekend. I think it was 25-23 they lost, but they played good stuff. The week before, they went to Bordeaux and lost by three points at Bordeaux, um, 30-27. So, I mean, it doesn't look good on paper, but actually the sort of nuts and bolts and how they'll feel around their camp, they won't feel too down on themselves, not too negatively, because they've still got some quality personnel that are playing well and they're throwing together some really good rugby. They, I think the third week before that, they lost to Montpellier, which was slightly less convincing, but, you know, it's a long old season. There's still 11, same, 11 games to go. I think they go up against Breve at the end of this month. We will be sort of head to head. They're only two points ahead of them and they're not on, on decent form either. So it, it doesn't look great on first reading, but when you look a bit closer, actually, I think they'll be confident they can maybe do something. It's so tight down the end of the table anyway. I think that the four last teams is a difference of three, four points. So anything could happen. Um, and as I said, they've got talented boys. Steph Armitage, friend of the show, Saili, Curran Drani, they've got some talent down there. So they could still do it. You never know. And quite a few teams did play three games over that period. But they're like, Toulon played none. And there were a number of other teams who had games cancelled. So there's a backlog coming, isn't there, Johnny? Yeah, and the question, again, it was muted in French press today that they were hoping the first rounds would possibly be played on the weekend of the 12th of February. Um, and the other ones are going to have to be played on, or they call them doublon here in France, the doubles, um, on Six Nations weekends because there's no other spot in the calendar. Once you've got the Champions Cup games that are reorganised as well, um, it is only those weekends that they can fit games. And, and that is great if you are coming up against Toulouse and they're not with Dupont and, and the rest, but... Um, Look, it's not good for other sides. You've got La Rochelle are going to have three play games, but but Toulon, you think, who probably won't lose too many players during the Six Nations, it's a good thing for them. Um, the timing works well for them. The teams they're going to play against, uh, it works into their hands, but for other sides, it obviously isn't great. It's how that calendar falls. It's not always easy, and you get teams that hate it more than others because they've got more Six Nations players, and unfortunately, they're going to be affected again. Toulon were desperate to play. Because don't forget that two months ago, Patrice Colazzo got the tap on the shoulder. Please leave. Uh, Franck Azema rocked up. First game in Clermont. They got pumped. And then gradually, I think they beat Lyon at home and then a couple of serious yeah. performances. But they were just gradually getting back at it. And you could tell that there was a change. Chesin Gobli hadn't, hadn't played a game. And now he was back. Uh, Eden Elizabeth, I think, got knocked out. Or I can't remember. He got, yeah, he got a third He's got three months commotion. He's got that. three months on the bench for his... Uh, After his November head. tests after the November test with, yep. with South Africa. So, you know, so there's a couple of problems. So you just want to play, you want to get those games. There's no, I'll tell you right now, there's no chance that the world, all those games will be played. It's humanly impossible. Somebody's going to have to give in too long. Yeah, you mentioned two potential, potential weekends. They're missing three games already. It's so I, I just don't know how they're going to do it. Somebody's going to have to give in. It's going to be just one of those years where you're going to have to, you're going to accept some 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 frustrating losses, but honestly, Toulon want to play. Franck Azema wants to play. He wants to get his 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 hand on the thing. I hope he's using this time wisely, and I'm sure that he is to actually get to know more into depth the the the, the so his team and stuff. But the last thing that he needed is his president Bernard Lemaitre saying that Eden Elizabeth and Facundo Isa are ah, they're a problem. They're a problem for your salary cap. They're a problem for your group. I see what I see what he means. Of course, it, it's understandable. Huge players, you want them to be there all the time, uh, and and not never to be called out on international duty because the thing is just too, too uh, how do you say that? Too um, impactful on on the on the depth of the squad. Yes, fair enough. You don't say it like that, do you? There's a big old picture of Ine Elizabeth with like biceps behind behind his ears, and all you can see is you know Ine Elizabeth and and Facundo Isa and, and are like a, like a, a rock an issue. Your, yeah, yeah, like an issue, like a stone in your in your boot or whatever you say in English uh, for your squad. I know Frank, he's not gonna like that. 
Well, let's get our guest on now then, because he had a rare weekend off after his side's trip to Toulouse was called off. But he'll be able to fill us in on all the goings on at Montpellier at the moment. England back where Zach Mercer joins us. How are you? Yeah, good, mate. Yourself? We're good. We're good. Thanks for having me, guys. And thanks for coming on. Talk us through what's going on at the moment, because your last couple of games have been cancelled because of COVID. A number of positive test results. Is everyone OK, first of all? Yeah, no, everyone's, it was more the situation with regard to the front row has not been able to produce the front row, really, which is where we struggled on. And uh, we had a couple of guys coming back um, with regards to like coming back from COVID and having to do the return to play. And it just wasn't safe for us to play. And it's gutting for us because we were six on the balance in the top 14. Uh, we haven't lost the game in, in six games. And uh, for us, that's massive. And we just want to play. It's, it's so tough because... I uh, every week you're building up to these games and be getting called off 48 hours before you're supposed to be playing. And for a rugby player, everyone just thinks, oh yeah, whatever. But it's actually it's quite mentally draining. At the same time, it's you work so hard to all week to face Toulon and then that's called off. And then you work so hard to face Toulouse and then that's called off. And then obviously it's Europe this weekend and who knows what's going to happen. So it's it's a tough time, but uh, as a club, we're in a great position. How are cases looking right now? So obviously you just mentioned that massive game this weekend. You got Leinster this weekend away in Dublin. How is the situation? Are those front rowers back fit? Are we going to see a game this weekend? Are you, are you ready to go? Oh no, yeah, no, we're all back fit now. We've, all the lads have come out of isolation, and we had today off, and we're back in training tomorrow. Looking as far as we're concerned, we're going uh, to Leinster to do a job. So we haven't played in two weeks, so it, it, it's a good challenge for us. And also, you just mentioned your day off. Talk us through your day off, because it's different. We've just been mentioning, our, like, I'm in <laughs> southwest of France, where it's pissing down with rain. Benji and Tim were back in the UK, where it's pissing down rain anyway, 24-7. Montpellier, I've been there two years there. Great time in my life. What's it like just now? What are you up to today in your well, day off? Well, on a day off, normally I get up at six, get on the walk bike and go for a run. <laughs> mate, <again>. you're on <laughs> the wrong podcast. <laughs> no, Philippe no, doesn't mate. listen, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I was blessed today. We, uh, the sun, sun was shining, a bit cold, but... Went down to the golf course and had a have had a game of golf with Henry Thomas, obviously, and uh, Bruce Rihanna uh, and a friend of his. So yeah, got down there in the sun. It was nice. And how is Montpellier treating you? Because it is a special place. And when you arrive, I grew up in Glasgow. You grew up partly in Glasgow as well. Complete culture shock, complete change, lifestyle, weather. It's an insane part of the world. So give us a little insight into how you're enjoying it and the feel for the place. Yeah, uh, so it's real tough for me and my fiance when we came over because it was because of COVID. We couldn't actually ever, we never came to the place. And the first time we came here, we got the Eurostar down and uh, pulled into the train station. And we were pretty much just like, so this is it. This is where we're going to spend uh, the next couple of years of, of my rugby career here. And walked across the road, went to the hotel and walked around. And we're like, oh, this is it. It's so real. And the next day, we checked into the house and we haven't seen the house. I've only seen it on FaceTime. and. Um, so to see it in person was pretty special and we got very lucky on that front but as a place I mean it's absolutely beautiful it's it's right by the sea and uh, the town and everything is just it's pretty spectacular and like you said obviously growing up in Glasgow and Yorkshire and uh, it's completely different parts of the world and it's it's pretty special and I do believe that I'm so happy off the field that it does affect the way I am on, on the pitch and uh, I've got no worries here the weather's perfect and Obviously, now I just want to get down to to playing some rugby again. I get along really well with with Philippe, and uh, and from bouncing into you when uh, last I think it was a semi final challenge cup last yeah. year when Montpellier came, and I, I saw you say hello to him. I, I'm sure you get along well. Um, <laughs> to talk to me about that first phone call. That first, it, uh, tell me if, please, it's Philippe that gave you that first phone call to be like, listen, I want I want to give you, you know. Give you a taster of Montpellier. What did he sell? What did he sell to you? What was oh yeah, I forget about the, the whole thing. Don't give me the answer about making myself a better rugby player. I'm gonna come back and play for England in three years. None of that one. The actual what did he sell about the life, about you know, how much you're gonna enjoy it there? Um, yeah, it's weird. Obviously, you know Philippe, and Philippe doesn't believe his English is that good, but he actually is a lot better than he thinks he is. So the conversation's like he thinks he's not getting across, but it's actually like, no, he's perfectly good English. Um, so Borat's English is perfect, right? It's just yeah, his accent. Exactly. It's, it's, yeah, it's his accent is all over the shop. Yeah, I'll let you tell it that you could compare it to Borat. <laughs> <laughs> um, now the first conversation was obviously I've never been in the open market to be able to go anywhere different. So for me, it was a bit like surreal, and obviously your agents deal with a lot of it. And I remember uh, I was sat in my fiance's house, family house, and he, he called me on the phone. Um, 
And to be honest, he was just, he was just so in the dream, really. He was like telling the squad and what the squad's got and what they've achieved. And um, obviously not a lot at that point. They were sitting towards the bottom of, of the table. Um, but for me, it's a name like Montpellier, you just know. It's not like, like every rugby player kind of just knows, even though they're quite, they're not an old club. I only found this out the other day. You think Montpellier's got rich in history, but it actually is not. It's quite fairly new to the rugby scene. Um, but for me, obviously, I I didn't have any aspiration to go to France. I really didn't. It, and then when I, after that phone call with Philippe, I was like, do you know what? Why not? Um, obviously, the, the perks of playing in the top 14 are massive. And uh, obviously, meeting Al Chad as well for the first time. Uh, he gets a lot, of, like, a lot of press release, but I think the guy's brilliant. I, I, I find him ridiculously interesting. Um, his speeches, like for what he's achieved in his life, is is actually so surreal, and um, he's actually an inspir- in, inspirational guy. And um, I do believe that's why we're doing so well on the pitch this year. I think everyone's bought into what he wants to do, and the way he dealt with his business during COVID and etc. It's kind of like he's kind of motivated us to push on. And um, I do believe, like I remember, we had a about three games in, we had a crisis meeting. I we lost. To Toulouse at home just uh, with a missed kick. And then we lost to uh, Claremont at home with a missed kick. And I was like, oh, with two games in, everyone that knows rugby, when the crisis meetings happens, you're like, oh, here we go. Uh, he actually asked me to speak in this meeting. Um, and I was, a bit, I was a bit taken back, really, because um, an English guy coming in and then asking what my opinion is with regard to the situation we're in, I was a bit like, okay, and obviously... The translator was there and he translated for me. And um, and I think from then on, we kind of just clicked and we kind of on the same vision. And um, for me, I just want to play for, for the lads and for him massively because I owe him. He, he took a shot at me to bring me here. So, What did you say, mate? I said, like, when we look at the games at the start of the year, we actually haven't been beaten by a better team. Uh, a lot of the games we, we were in, uh, we were better than them, but with errors or whatever. like we, I can honestly say now that I can put my hand up in, in the top point and say, I don't think we've been beaten by a better team. Um, I think there's errors that we've made, but I don't believe they're better than us. And um, to be honest, I just said, like, I, I can sense, you know, like Benjamin would say, like the pride, and you know, Johnny, like the proud, the prideness that these guys have when they put the jersey on is ridiculous. And it's completely different to the premiership. And I think that's a massive part of that. And we've kind of stripped back to that and just played for each other and played for the jersey. And, after that meeting, we've gone six in a row. So I think wow. it's, obviously that meet. I'm not saying it was my speech, mate. But- that translator, <laughs> eyes, that that hey translator, eyes. that translator is a hell of a, a spokesperson. Yeah, I would say some of the wow. translator would probably say it would be different. I'll tell you a funny story about the translator later because oh, we were we were in Paris. Um, so Tom Whitford, who's our team manager, great yeah. bloke, English dude. Uh, uh, too long before and now at Montpellier. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So he started the meeting and Philippe's there, like in the change room at the Paris Stadium, harassing, screaming, screaming, screaming. And then Tom goes, We need to tickle them in the breakdown. And then the English side looking and go, What? Tickle them? And he just straight face just goes, Tickle them. And where I look like, I look to my left and I've got Henry Thomas. And, and I'm like, Did he just say tickle? And obviously, because it's like two minutes before kickoff, you're like, Right, let's just crack on. And then after the game, he's con- he, we won, and then he got completely, absolutely shredded after the game. So it's uh, the translating stories are quite funny. So uh, yeah, it's good to crack over here. Oh mate, some was, when when Philippe goes full tilt, you might even need a tr- translator in French, mate. All, all you need to know <laughs> is that he's a top boy. He's got a good heart. Oh, he lives yeah. for those moments. He yeah. lives for the for the boys to be to get all jacked up, and that's what he likes to transmit to to the boys. He's always talking about culture, about families, about people. That's why he liked it in, in England so much because there was only him. Who was, who was there screaming everywhere. That's why they were so different. You can see that, like, with the way he speaks and he talks about team spirit and what we've got so well this year. And I feel, I feel like Olivier Azam is very similar. I think he'll first want to say that he wasn't technically brilliant, but he would probably go on the pitch and give his all <laughs> and do what he had to do to win the game. So, yeah, it's good. No, I respect the coaches here massively. The way Zach's playing this year, I don't think he needs any advice, Benji, but Philippe, what does he like? Does he like a bottle of red on his desk on a Monday morning or how do you sweeten uh, the deal? I, 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 all I remember is that that semi final challenge cup, and I told you after the games, I, I think he carried the ball about 64 times that day. <laughs> and I was I, after the game, I looked at him, you know, mate, you've signed in Montpellier already. And Philippe is like, yeah, slow down now, slow down. I don't want you to get injured. That's all he cared about. <laughs> no, mate, Philippe just like somebody, he likes somebody genuine. I think he likes the fact that you've, you've got a, 
you've got you've got chats you don't mind a bit of banter you just want to go there with a big smile on your face and do well and do your best and that's what he wants he wants curious curious open positive people just go hard and then we'll deal with the shit later and you mentioned Mohad Altreb is that one of the big differences between the premiership and top 14 obviously you had Bruce Craig at, at Bath the, the owners are a bit more hands-on no massively I mean I think when I was leaving Bath I'll be honest now I'm putting my hand up and said Bruce I didn't speak to Bruce once um, he didn't come to me and try and keep me. I didn't even deal with him. I didn't speak to him until the, the, my final game. Um, and that's the, wow. last, that's, the only, that's the only time I saw him. Um, so with Altrad, it, it's pretty special because, I mean, it, it, so you don't know how he gets there, but if you're playing away, he'll be there. A bit, like the, you'll, you'll come down from your He's room. in the PJ, he's mate. He's not, yeah. in the, he's not in the bus. He's in the private jet. Yeah, he's don't not worry about how he gets there. You know how he gets there. Um, so I'm just walking down and there he is. And I fair play. Like, and then he'll give a little chat before the game and uh, and then he'll be in the change room after the lads. But during the games, they're smoking his cigar and whatever. But I actually do think he wants to learn. He really does want to learn about the game of rugby. Like, so he asks questions. He wants to know what's going on all the time. And but I just think it's so special, like, to have someone that owns a club, to be there within that environment all the time. I think it's, it's, it's massive. Like he knows exactly what's going on, and if he's not there, his friends there. Jean. Looking, yeah, looking what's going on, and then it's like, so he, he's always looking, and it's like not a negative thing. Every guy has negative because he's watching you, but for me, it's the complete opposite. It's also testament to his personality as well, because he's not a like obviously it's your money you're paying for this massive play toy, effectively. But you get people that come in and like Benji mentioned at the top of the show that the sort of messaging from the Toulon president during the week, just like putting his foot in it or clangers, but Moed is very tactful in that he's good at speaking with you one-on-one. -on -one. He's not overly outspoken in the press to put his foot in it or make it harder for the players. Yeah, and he's actually, he's a pleasure to be around in the club as well. That's the, and I mean, that can be from stupid stuff. Like when we were there, Sean Tain happy would be like, mate, can I borrow the keys for your Lamborghini? And he'd go and take the cars around yeah. the car park. Like stupid stuff like that, really friendly, all the way to actually wanting to engage, get to know you, make sure you're settled. And even now, like if I go and do TV stuff, he's like, oh, Johnny, like our old Scottish mate, how are you getting on? We miss you. Like he's he's really good with the soft skills. But as you mentioned, he, he's keen to learn. So even though he does nothing in terms of no, rugby technical knowledge is a special subject, yeah. business, the guy is an absolute oh, yeah. the best in the world. And it's amazing to see how much he has learned over the years in the rugby sphere as well, because it's, he, he's just so good. He's such an intelligent, articulate, and he just works his backside off. He's some man. And there's a tip for you, Zach. Ask him to borrow his Lamborghini. I'll tell you what, I see his Bentley, <laughs> see his Bentley pulled up before games. So I just say, if I have a good performance, I'll just say, mate, do you mind if I take it for a spin? <laughs> I'll bring it back one day. <laughs> Um, apart from the Lamborghinis and the Bentleys, you mentioned it was the first time really you'd been out of contract. So you had these offers, presumably from lots of different clubs, all on the table. What made you pick Montpellier out of all of them? Um, to be honest, like, yeah, I don't, obviously, like I said earlier on the show, like Montpellier, everyone just seems to know. Um, and obviously, Lazowski was here before and he obviously influenced my decision. And he, had a, he looked at it in a very different light because obviously... He kind of joined the, the Montpellier and then he got voted the worst signing of the top 14. And uh, and then somehow he turned it around and... You just threw him under the bus there. Yeah, no, but that's... <laughs> you know, and they wanted you know, to keep him. They wanted to keep him. Yeah, the, press can say, the press can say whatever yeah, no. they want. Philippe loved oh, him. And they yeah, really but, liked him. But then if you're still going to start the season, he was the best player by the end of it. He was ridiculous. And like, he absolutely loved it here. I mean, obviously he had to go back to Saris regarding the contract stuff, but... He wanted to be here and he really enjoyed it. He got on really well with the lads and he actually just loved the place. And so when I spoke to him once, and that was it. He convinced me to come. And that's when they're sitting at the bottom of the league, like near the bottom of the league. So for me, I was just like, yeah, well, he sold it to me. And obviously the place and obviously Philippe and being by the South of France is obviously nice. But for me, I just believe that the club had ambition and with Philippe in charge. And I believe like I've shown this year, we've shown that we are capable of, of winning some of it. So that's 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 the question I've got for you. A couple of minutes ago, you were saying that you can't wait. Obviously, fingers crossed, everything goes well. That you guys go to Leinster, a hell of a game, Aviva or the RDS or whatever the yeah. other one. Uh, proper game of rugby. Everyone wants to play it. The only um, criticism I've got against Montpellier, well, one of the only, but you're on the show right now, so I'll just go through one. <laughs> is is the fact that 
even when you in the in like four or five six years ago when Vern Cotter transformed that club got to the Premiership fi- top 14 final they were smoking everyone they did not take uh, Champions Cup seriously they just weren't interested because there was maybe a lack of depth of the, of the squad maybe and they really wanted to concentrate on you know step by step first let's do domestic then we'll go to Europe and you just said oh we can't wait to get out there is it can't wait to get out there because it's a hell of a game or you guys actually have ambition for Europe this year no me you're right I mean uh, I found it really weird when I came because in the Premiership, everyone's like, oh, Champions Cup. Like, it's so exciting. It's a different competition. It's it's something that you like dream of playing in the Champions Cup. And I remember rocking up and I was like, so obviously we had Exeter away and when the team sheet was named, it was a bit, it was a different team. It, obviously we had, we had to give our internationals time off so they had to go away and whatever. And, but I do believe that we do want to take it seriously. Obviously we've got five points against Leinster, obviously because of COVID, they had COVID and whatever. But I do believe we're in a position now with the depth we do have that we can go after Europe as well as as well as the top 14. And you kind of see it with only like Toulouse, La Rochelle, but they are the top teams in the, in, in the top 14 will go after Europe. But we're one of them top teams now and I believe that we will go after it. And obviously, but that's me speaking from a player's point of view. Obviously, you know, Philippe or whatever. But for me, I, I, I'd be disappointed if we didn't believe that we could do something in that competition. In terms of going from Bath to Montpellier, have you just taken your game from Bath to Montpellier or have you had to adapt in terms of the style of play and what's being asked of you in the top 14? No, I mean, obviously, Philippe signed me for being Bath at, uh, for being Zach at Bath. So I wasn't going to come here and, and, and change my game. Obviously, you have to keep developing, you have to keep improving. Um, and this league, I think, Johnny, you played in it and my dad knows a lot about rugby and he came to one game and he's like, he couldn't believe the physicality of it. He he watched it and was just like hearing the collisions and everything that was going on. I, I just think this league is ridiculously physical. I um, it's such a tough league, and obviously I, I don't. I, when I was back in the Premiership, I was like, oh yeah, whatever. Like the Premiership's the toughest league, or whatever. But I actually do believe now that this league is is massively physical. Um, so obviously, it kind of suits my game a little bit because I'm a bit I'm a bit evasive and try and do different ways to get around people rather than trying to run over them, but. It's always nice when you've got uh, like Charlu or Paul Valencia or that in front of you. You've got right the Bruce brothers and send them in, and you can kind of chill at the back and, and do what you want to do. But um, obviously, I've had to be more physical in this league, uh, and that's something that I've always been questioned on in England, which is kind of ironic, really. And um, that's I've come here and I'm enjoying it. And do you know what? Yeah, it's a physical league, and but I'm not scared of it, and I'm just kind of embracing it, and I will keep developing. Who questioned you and said you weren't physical? When I watch you, you're physical. That's ridiculous. Oh, man, it's, it's, it's Where's that come from? Of, well, it's kind of gone round in England. That obviously, I'm not 130 kilos and um, whatever. But you're 115, though, mate. I played in top 14. I was 105. <laughs> a little skinny Scottish kid, mate. You are physical. No, it's it's just a it's just a thing you get. Obviously, you get labelled with stuff, and um, I didn't come here just to to prove that I was that. I came here for obviously different reasons, but I, I've kind of come here expecting I wasn't expecting to like develop this physicality side but I've come here and I'm like I've had to because the lads are so much bigger and um, I do all that to the, like the coaches the way they've helped me out being here and I think that's why I've settled in so easily like the first game it was just kind of normal like it didn't really feel like a new club but you bring that x factor and that point of difference as well because you can ball play you can tip the ball on you can step you can fend and also weirdly it's quite strange when you go, when you play in the UK and it's pissing it down for six months and then you arrive in Montpellier, you've got dry deck. Like Montpellier is a hard pitch. It's so easy to play top of the ground rugby. So you fit it in straight away. Your performances have been phenomenal and great to watch. I want to ask you really briefly about fitting in in that aspect, the actual, the gameplay, but then almost more importantly, the changing room Montpellier, because there's been so much change since I left the club. Like when I left, Fabian Galtier was still the coach. We've had since then Jake White, we've had Vern, we've had Xavier Garbajosa. Now we've got Philippe. I think there's only like three blokes that are still there. Yeah. When I played, you've got like Misha, who yeah. Luce had probably yeah. told you, great boy. Uh, Fufu, captain, still there. You've got yeah. Benoit Payog, who's um, oh, the club behind the scenes. You mentioned Moed, but does it feel more settled? It, it was kind of unsettled when I was there. You had this massive potential that the club could be the biggest in France if it weren't for a couple of odd things around the club. But now it's a few more settled, a great place to be. Obviously, you mentioned geographically where it is, but what's the club like? It's infrastructure behind the scenes. Yeah, no, I think obviously Montpellier does have a reputation of people going there just 
for not rugby reasons, just to pick up a paycheck and go on the pitch and whatever. Uh, but obviously trying to settle into a French changing room, Johnny, you know it, it's tough because there's only so much you can socialise with because of your language barrier. And we have lessons every week and trying to develop that. And for the lads, first of all, I just want to say how outstanding they have been. Like the way they've let me settle in here is massive. And like the, the way they kind of took me under the arm and looked after me and like the way Tom, the team manager, and all the coaches just kind of like, oh, like I said, like the first game of the year, I felt like I've been there for five years. Like, Quality. And, massive. and uh, like you said, like the change room for me, I, I think it's one of the best change rooms I've been in. Like there's a ping pong table. I don't know if it's there. And like the social aspect of that there is massive. And lads just love being there. Like I don't get it. Like it cracks me up because we finish training and lads will sit there and play ping pong for an hour and just socialise. Whereas in the premiership, it's like you finish training, who's in the car first off home? Do you know what I mean? It's like, which I think is massive because you're kind of developing that team spirit off the field. And I do believe that by Philippe coming in and Olivier Azam and Jamba and Bruce Rehan, Alex Ruiz, these coaching staff have real settled everyone down and it's a real good place to go, go to work. And um, I believe that it does reflect on our, on our performances on the field. Johnny mentioned his weight there. He mentioned he's a former back rower. He used to play for Glasgow. You were in the Glasgow Warriors Academy for a little bit. You've gone to Montpellier. He played for Montpellier. He's not asking. No, where's your next, mate? <laughs> and are you following in his footsteps? Oh well, Johnny's obviously uh, done well at international rugby and everything. So if I if I'm anything like Johnny, then I'll take that. Mate, you know what I'm gonna say, Zach. I, I'm gonna call you Little Zachy because that's <laughs> but Benji. You boys won't know this, but so when I was at Glasgow. Zach's dad, Gary Mercer, was our defence coach. So little Zachy would come to training, ball under arm. Like, the ball was bigger than he was. And, like, little Zachy, you must have been five or six, mate. You were absolutely oh, wow. tiny. But rugby daft at the time, you could tell. Um, but obviously, you grew up in Scotland. You played under 16s, 18s, and then yeah. you switched over to England under 20s. I wanted to ask you, obviously, if you had decided to play for Scotland, you'd probably have way more caps than I've got now. You'd have 50 or 60 or 70 already. <laughs> But how did that conversation go? Was it a, if you come over to England 20s, we'll push you through and you'll get capped? And was there a tug of war? Like, how did it happen? And then when you made that decision to play and get your first test for England, was Scotland saying, like, Zach, you've got residency, come back up here, come on, you can be the boy? Like, how did it all pan out? No, it's just weird, mate. It's like, it's obviously, I played Scotland 16s. Uh, my dad was the coach at the time, actually, so probably the only reason I played. But <laughs> So I did Scotland 16s, uh, did all Glasgow stuff, and obviously I went to school in Edinburgh and, uh, played there and it's weird because I played Scotland 16s and I was trialled to get into the Scotland under 18s a year young and I didn't get in I didn't get picked so I didn't play that year and then obviously then I was looking because it was the last year of school what I wanted to do like try and chase a professional contract and it got to probably two months into term at school and Glasgow didn't offer me a contract Edinburgh nothing and Rob Moffat uh, who's pretty well known to the rugby world was the de- uh, the head of rugby at the school and he's like mate Edinburgh are going to offer you and Glasgow are going to offer you a contract right at the start so I was like okay whatever and then nothing came through so I was like oh, alright um, and then I, I had footage and he got sent out to premiership clubs and Bath came back and said yeah obviously he started to bring to Bath and I signed with Bath at the start of school um, and then Scott, <laughs> Scott so it was like I did all the training camps and we we uh, I remember the day, actually, the emails were coming out for selection. And a good friend of mine um, who was playing got an email. He said, text me, he's like, did you get an email? I was like, oh, no, I ain't got an email yet. Um, so it was a bit strange. And then uh, Eddie Pollock, who was a Scotland under-18 coach at the time, texted me and went, mate, I'm coming to school to see you. And so he came in, obviously, and he's like, mate, oh, we're not picking you for Scotland 18s because you signed for Bath. He's like, oh. because you signed for Bath, we can't. Oh. we need to develop the players that stayed in Scotland. So so I was like, obviously I was a bit gobsmacked really. I was a bit like, okay. And then I, Peter Walton, who's the England under 18s coach, literally I walked to our meeting and rang him and he said, well, come down with us. And a couple of weeks later, I was playing for England against Scotland and that was it then. So moved down to Bath and then that was, forever, that was it. Then I just chased the England dream then. And as you can tell, Zach, Johnny is absolutely Hi. desperate to, re- to recruit you back for Scotland. Um, but I'm not sure if you've been following these changes in the World Rugby eligibility laws. They don't affect you, I guess, do they? You, you qualify no, on I'll residency. Say, you know, I, I've had loads of people say, but I actually don't qualify for Scotland now. Yeah. Obviously, I, 
I moved out of Scotland and well, you can move I, back, mate. It's not too to late. You can move back. back. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to tell Mrs. Can we move from Montpellier back to Glasgow? Mate, sell her the dream. <laughs> sell her the dream. <laughs> Um, and then, so, mate, going back a step before we go on to, obviously, eligibility doesn't apply to you now. We can rubbish that rumour. Um, but when you got first cap for England under Eddie, was there a tug of war again then before that first senior appearance or was it all no. plain sailing? No, for me, I was, I kind of, I think it's just, as soon as I left Scotland, Scotland pushed me under the bus and I just wanted to play for England. And it was, obviously, I'm, I'm born in Yorkshire, obviously, and uh, proud Englishman. And But for me, it was just like, I kind of, as soon as I was at Bath, I did a year and then I was straight into international stuff and I was in the camp then for about two two years before I actually got capped. So I was kind of always in that environment and then obviously I got the opportunity to play for, for England against South Africa and that was it. And then that was the start of my international career and obviously I only ended up getting two caps in the end, which is obviously disappointing, but I'm still young and uh, I've had conversations now with Eddie that I, I also don't want to pursue uh, the England stuff. And you mentioned you're still young, you're in form. Eddie was at one of your games recently with the cast staff. So you sat next to Matthias Roland, one of my mates, which was picked up by all the TV cameras. <laughs> you want to earn more caps. Has there been any conversation ongoing? Is it looking like you'd be drafted back in at any time? Or is he giving you any pointers to work on? Mate, it's funny that day because I remember I was in a change room. I didn't even know Eddie was there. And I walked out to do the warmth and I saw his face on the big screen. And I was a bit like, hang on a minute. I looked around and obviously he knows Pierre Broncon and but then I was like, I'm the only Englishman on the pitch today. So it was a bit of like pressure on and um I expected him after the game just to kind of disappear and but I ended up having a real good chat with Eddie and um we just had a nice honest chat with him regarding how he thinks I've been and he's been impressed with how I've, I've been in, the, in this league and he's obviously impressed with the French league, which is why he was there because he wanted to see what they were doing differently and um yeah, I've got. Obviously, it's quite nice at the moment because I've got no pressure on me. I'm here with Montpellier. I don't. I don't have to worry about selections or whatever. I'm just purely focused on doing the best for the team. And but who knows what could happen down the line? Obviously, I still have aspirations to play for England, and Eddie knows that. And um, so whatever will be, will be. And just got to keep playing well and keep enjoying it because ultimately, the rugby's a short career, and I'm here. And Montpellier, I love it here. The coaches are like. I'm just learning every day, so I'm pretty blessed, really. And did Eddie say, I wish I'd given you a ring <laughs> eight months ago or whatever he before you signed? He I wish he said that. He didn't, he didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously no one can predict the future, but you mentioned you want to play for England again, so presumably the plan is it all goes well, you're you loving life in Montpellier, you have your spell there, but then you do move back to the Premiership in order to be available for selection again. No, obviously, but who knows what could happen? I mean... Everyone knows what happened. Look at Armitage. Everyone was saying Stefan should go back and try and play for England, but France can keep you. France is it's such a beautiful place. The, the league's so special, and who knows what could happen? I, you could have a chance to me next year, and I might have said, you know what, I, I love it here, and I don't want to leave. So obviously, I, I'm still young. I do have aspirations to play for England, but the way my rugby's going here at the moment, I'm really enjoying it. You mentioned how special the place is. You've got engaged, haven't you, since you moved to France? So congratulations. And is the Thank romance rubbing I, up on you? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I'm very lucky. And as everyone says, uh, happy wife, happy life, really. So I, I was very, very lucky with my fiance, And uh, the way she supported me moving out here has been really special. And it kind of just kind of put the ice on the cake, really. And obviously asked her to, to marry me. And that would be going to place uh, in July this year. So, yeah, not long. Congratulations, mate. Well Thank done. you, guys. Where did Happy you ask me? Well, it's funny, mate. Like, I didn't get down the one knee stuff. I, I, I couldn't get it. was in pre season, wasn't it? So it was a bit, couldn't get down that low. <laughs> um, no, just on the beach. Um, obviously, just, just what beach was it? The, just down the road. So uh, it was on a tw uh, 21st. So it was, a, it was a nice. I got actually, it's a funny story. I, I woke up and got her a Hoover for a 21st. And I think she looked at me like, <laughs> oh, mate. So you felt obliged to buy a ring after that present? No, so I already had the ring. I already had the ring, and she was like, Hoover, oh, okay, thank you, yeah, okay, yeah, nice. Little did she know that I was going to propose, like, three hours later. Um, so obviously that, that kind of saved me a little bit. And it was lucky we had her parents out at the time, so it was, it was a real special, special occasion. You mentioned translators earlier on. How is the French coming along? Do you need any tips from Benji? Yeah, potentially, mate. Obviously, 
To be honest, just tell me how to speak to Philippe and we'll be all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, Why? Philippe, but... Philippe, Philippe, you'll be you'll be absolutely fine, and and Olivia as I'm speaks really well too and stuff. Yeah, all you need to know, oh. all you need to know is that in France, they care more about the how how you behave, how you yeah. react to adversity, how you show up week in week out, how you're honest, and sometimes you can be a little bit volcanic. You know, it's fine if things go go a little bit too far. You know, it's it's not the issue as long as you're being genuine, straight shooter, and and give your absolute best. It's it's that's the only way to go about it no massively and I think that's why we kind of fit in well you obviously you come in you perform and as long as you perform and then there's no questions asked really but we do learn like we have classes every week and uh, with the foreign lads it's, it's good crack uh, a teacher comes in and uh, teaches us on a Thursday so it's good fun and obviously the lads here I'm actually very lucky and with regards to how like, much English the lads can actually speak um uh, I'm blessed with um, Philippe, Olivia Azam and uh, Bruce Rihanna, who, who's obviously a skills coach, he's very good French as well. And Alex Ruiz, the referee, he tries not to speak English, but he can blatantly speak English, but I think he just decides that he doesn't want to. <laughs> oh, so, mate, speak, speak to me about that. Speaking of that, because I, I, I did not like him as a ref. Oh, my <laughs> Lord. He was, he was an annoying, annoying little shit as a ref. He was good, don't get me wrong. Okay, he was good. I just didn't like his personality. He would really, he would really get into you. You know, he would be like, D -d 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 -d. I, to I told you, you know, I just, he just really, really get on your nerves. He's like, when the call now, it was a great impression. He does that, <laughs> didn't he? But, but, but first of all, like, I remember when he first got signed as a coach, I was the bath and all the bath lads were sending me these, like, articles saying, mate, you signed a referee as a coach. It's quite, it's a clever move though. It's, it's a clever move to, to go think outside the box. No, first of all, Alex is great. I mean, he's, he gives a bit of stick. He, he can take it well and he's, he's a good lad and his English is very good. Um, I think he obviously joining the rugby stuff is kind of pushed away from the referee side. And um, I do believe he's actually been a real great addition to this coaching staff because every question he knows the answer to. Um, and so what, what's he do? Oh, tell, tell us, what, what's he do? What do you do exactly? Does he like prepare sessions for you guys or no, does so he help a, the boys so he, um, or help the coaches? No, so he obviously, he's, he's a phone coach. He does the break. He, he massively focused on the breakdown. Um, so he, he that he breakdowns his area, um, and then before a game he'll preview the referee. So whatever the referee. So for example, we played Beerix two weeks ago, and the referee was so hot on the breakdown, we knew that all week because Alex told us um, and backed up with stats, and uh, and then obviously he rests the sessions, which is massive because mm. you want an international referee saying if you're offside or saying whatever. And then yeah, that's all cool. The all these rules that are getting brought in or chopping and changing, he just knows. Uh, and it's always good when you go into a game and he knows the referee. Uh, so you can have a word or if the referee has an absolute shocker, just rip into him then. And you say, what's your mate doing? So, <laughs> but no, he's, he's a good addition. And um, obviously, like I said, Bruce as well, Bruce Rihanna um, was at Bordeaux for a new me years. And he's at Bristol. As, Bristol, yeah. Uh, he's coming as a skills coach. So he's been massive for us. Benji didn't sugarcoat what he thought of Alex Ruiz. So when you get to training tomorrow morning, oh, mate, just I... mention Benjamin Casey's <laughs> name, see what he says. Do you know what I'll do? I'll just send him this, this interview and just, uh, just listen. <laughs> <laughs> listen to Kayser. Like there's no chance in the world that whilst you're on the pitch and you get roughed by a guy, you can get along well. It's it's a bit complicated. You know, there's some, some heated oh, right, moments. Man. But um, no, it's just, it's, it's just the attitude. But at the same time, you know it in France. You need to have a big set of nuts to get in there and tell the boys, put them back in their place when needed. Yeah. You know, show, was, show absolutely everybody who's boss. It was and, funny, uh, like, we yeah. played, played one game and Roman Poit was a ref. <laughs> he was on touch judge. <laughs> and he speaks very good English. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I'm, I think it was only two, three games in and they scored a try. And I looked at him and I was like, mate, it's clearly a knock on. Like, and then he comes, back, he comes back to me in French. I'm just like, I just played shoot. I knew what he was saying, but I was just like, oh man, I don't know, I don't, I don't understand what you're on about. Like, I was like, you're gonna sit by, I don't like, don't understand. <laughs> and then he comes to me in blatant English. I goes, you're in France now, you speak French. And then that was it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, I was like, oh god. Uh, but every time we see him now, we laugh and joke about it. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's it's a special place. This place, it's it's interesting, and there'll be loads of stories to tell when I 
when when, I, when you stop playing here and yeah, it's it's funny because it's, it's so different to the Premiership, but so similar. It's just it's just good. It's just good. What have been your biggest? What are your biggest things you've noticed so far, difference wise? Like for me, arriving at Montpellier was the passion, and you mentioned the players. For me, it was twofold. So it was the players, the passion they had, but the crowds as well. Those are the two things. I added that the physicality and how big everyone was. Those are the three. I couldn't believe how fired up everyone was. How much like a carnival the crowd was, and how bloody big everyone was in the top fourteen. Those are the three things I couldn't get my head around when I first arrived. Can I the same for you? Yeah, no, massively. I mean, first of all, the size of the mutants that you come up against in this league is just ridiculous. I mean, every time you walk out, you're like, oh, here we go. And like I said, luckily I've got some some big units around me to help me out. Um, but then, like you said, it's the passion, like for the lads. Like you can go into a change room and know before the game's even kicked off that we're going to win this game. Because the way the lads are, they, like their mannerisms and whatever, they're just so pumped for the game, and um, and then obviously feed off the crowd. And as you go into Montpellier, you've got that tunnel of noise, and everyone's playing like a festival, and whatever. The, like you said, the crowd is so passionate, and they're everywhere. Like even if it's just a small bunch, we we'll go to Beirut three weeks ago, and there's a little small bunch of them that just travel everywhere, uh, which is pretty special. And the other thing I've noticed in this league is the referees. This is something I've really struggled with. Um, it's how differently they ref the game out here um, and how much more, like, I would say stricter. I'd say how much more stricter they are in the top 14. And it's definitely, I'm still watching some games now in the top 14. We watched the other day. And I was just like, that's never been given a penalty in, uh, in England or, like, pushes or shoves or punches. Like, the referees just kind of turn a blind eye and crack on. It's pretty, it's pretty ridiculous, but it is rugby and it's just like, let's just crack on, really. Sounds like the best way to do it is to have a chat with them like you did with Roman. So just get to know them, yeah, ask Alex, it. and then, yeah, he will be fine. I'll push the first guy and then I'll run back and hide behind, like, Paul Valencia or something and say, go on, Paul, crack on. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on, Zach. And um, it's great to hear how well things are going out there. And um, good luck for the rest of the season. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Good luck, mate. Congratulations on the engagement. Thank you, guys. Cheers, Cheers little Zaki. See you, mate. Cheers, Zach. Good luck this weekend. Cheers. Happy wife, happy life. That's something we can all agree on, eh? Well, yeah, I'm just glad he didn't ask boy. her on, mate, there's this beach. I remember on our first few months in Montpellier, went with Jim Hamilton to this beach next to Carrymere. So our favourite bar and like place to eat was Carrymere. I go there with the missus, go there with all the boys. And only on like our seventh time of going there, went there with Jim and our wives and Jim and I asked go for a walk down the beach. We literally, there's like a peggy fence blocking the restaurant from the other side. And then all you've got is like lads like this, Coke cans hanging out, absolutely <laughs> massive dongs, nudist beach, about 13 feet from where we're sitting having a lunch. And we had no idea. <laughs> so we had to go back to our missus and be like, nah, you can't go down that beach. It's dangerous. You're not allowed to walk down there. There's things you can't see. <laughs> Jim and I back no, with our tails between our legs. No coincidence that Jim Hamilton was involved in that story in a nudist speech. Mate, he absolutely <laughs> loved it. And that was it. After then, our wives weren't allowed to come for lunch. We would just go and have a walk and a chat and a coffee at Carrymer. <laughs> great part of the world. Absolutely love it. But great to hear him doing so well, Benji. Like we, we always talk about foreign foreigners going to the, the top 14. And it's great to hear when it, it goes well. And, and Zach is doing incredibly well this season. Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just amazing to hear him be so happy. Um, I, I loved it when he said, you know, it feels like he's been in the changing room for five years, that he enjoys the passion, he enjoys the people. Uh, he knows it's, it's a tiny little thing, but I thought it was, I, I'm really chuffed that he said it's true. Montpellier is only a, a newbie, not into the history of, of French rugby. That's not true. But in the, the top elite of French rugby, mm. definitely. I also thoroughly enjoy the fact that he's 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 sort of proud of where the, the club is going and how ambitious they are and um, and all that stuff. So to be fair, this it's down to his ability, absolutely. His mindset, most definitely. But hats off to Philippe Saint-André, who also had the flair and, and his, his knowledge. Philippe Saint-André is, is a premiership fanatic. I always remember um, he started me a France, an England-France game, first start in Six Nations or second start in Six Nations, whatever, in 2012, 13. And my wife, being English, she knew that it was an important game for me. And we never really spoke before. And I remember walking out in Tunnel and he sort of grabbed me around the shoulders. For you and me, that's a special game. 
and that, cause that's, that's how it is for him. He really considered his heart is split in two. He's got such a deep connection with his whole sales sharks mm -hmm. moments when they won the premiership and he was given uh, premiership coach of the year. And it was really a moment where France sort of kicked him out by the little door, just because his, his, his performances with, uh, remember, was Bourgoin, I think at the time, or didn't go so well. Um, and, and he, he struggled just a tiny bit and England was his goal, his, his, next step to the highest level of coaching and i think i can't remember if he did gloucester first and then sale or the other way around but yeah. sale was the pinnacle of his career and he came back as an internationally renowned successful coach and that's what he built around him um and that really got him back into the toulon gig and the french team gig and all those things so he really has a deep 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 connection uh, with the country he absolutely adores it he loves the capacity of the english to bluntly take the piss out of themselves but also be super super serious two seconds later he loves the traditions he loves those really really tight stadiums where the, the stands are just a few centimeters away from the touchline and the, ooh, oh, hey, all the singing and and the drinking and the socializing he just absolutely loves that 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 stuff so that's why he follows i think he, he used to commentate in france for rmc the yep. English Premiership. All the Premier. He only yeah, did yeah. it because because he loved it. He really he was really as a fanatic about the Premiership. And so there's only him basically to tell to not only him, but there's he, I'm not surprised if it's him who is like, listen, I know this guy Zach Mercer. He might not be Billy Vunipola in terms of size. He might not be as renowned as I don't know uh, Faletau if you want. Okay, but um, he's got something special, and actually he could fit in really nicely into a Montpellier uh, team that never lacked size ever. <laughs> that's never been an issue and he's repeated Paul Willems here six times but yeah because he's a big old unit um, and he would just bring this extra spice sparkle and his mindset will fit perfectly because I need a happy face he'll be happy so fair play Philippe great flair fair play Zach ability and mindset and it's just one of those good stories that we like to hear right it's about time we did our meter moment of the week isn't it so have you got one Benji I've got one. I've got one, boys, which is not such a hot, hot moment. But listen, um, meter is about the hot and cold. It's about, you know, knowing who, who is hot at the moment. And I, I really do agree with what Johnny said with how Beritz showed a proper strong face in Bordeaux. They absolutely dominated the game for 20 minutes. Then Bordeaux, top of the po top 14, came back to the mixer and ended up squeezing a win. But just to get the defensive bonus point, um, Beritz had to score a final try. Uh, in the last sort of seconds of the game. And big old Francis Saili rocked up outside in uh, sort of line and bulked a couple of guys over the line. So it's not only because he was he was a gentleman and, and was really kind and nice to share some really good anecdotes with us in the pod. But on top of that, I just think he's been pretty, pretty good for Biritz from the beginning of the season. He's been really hanging on uh, for, for that team in terms of uh, performances and really putting his body on the line and just scored that try outside in. You know, it's the type of guy who's really there for the team. He's really there for that club and all those foreigners who keep on on giving all, all, all that. That's all I want to see. That was really a guy who cared about how Biritz were, 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 were behaving. So that's why I would like to give him Francis Saeli for his final try against Bordeaux a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago. Um who got them a defensive point the point, a well-deserved defensive point the point, the meter moment of the match. You on board with that, Johnny? Oh, uh, 100%. Especially, you never know for Beer, it's how important that one point's going to be come the end of the season. Um, so yeah, manner of how they did it, um, getting that one point towards the end of the game and that man, Francis Seidley, is an absolute legend. So 100%, the meter moment of the week, Francis Seidley. That was Benji and Johnny's Meter moment of the week. And Meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer. They've made over 9 million cooks better with their revolutionary app as well. So it's no surprise their users are growing rapidly every day. If you've ever said your pork or turkey's dry, then Meter's for you. And you can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan. Enter a whole new world of cooking and join the Metaverse at Meter.com. And just use the code FRENCHPOD10 at checkout for 10% off any full price item as well and before we move on we need to do the big unveil don't we we had a competition just before christmas to win hundreds of pounds worth of meter goodies so do you want to do the drum roll benji let johnny announce the winner whatever that is <laughs> and the winner is welcome to the metaverse ed birch well done, that man. We'll be well sending done, you a pile of Meter goodies. Welcome to the Meterverse. And thank you to Meter 
for being our sponsor for this segment and arranging a nice pile of goodies for Ed. Well done, mate. Well done, Ed. Absolutely. Congratulations, Ed. Let's have a look ahead to the return of the Champions Cup now then. First of all, it's great that rounds three and four are going ahead as things stand, as we're recording. (laughs) Anything could happen. (laughs) And it's all because of the necessary exemptions that have been negotiated with the French government after a lot of games were postponed just before Christmas. So we're assuming there will be a few that may fall by the wayside in these rounds as well. It's if these two rounds get cancelled or postponed that the shit is going to hit the fan. And look, you hope that the time is right because the government messaging now is that we have to move on, we have to live with it, we have to treat this like a flu. So are we going to keep testing everyone? Is everyone going to have to keep testing to play? Are positive cases going to be treated in the same manner? Are you still going to have to isolate? Hopefully not for much longer. So no idea. Hopefully we just get ahead on this weekend, get as many played as possible and see what happens. And just for listeners not in France, explain the situation there because it's very different to the UK, isn't it? And there are exemptions for the Champions Cup, which means it can go ahead. But generally everyone playing in the top 14 or leagues lower down in France have to be vaccinated, don't they? So that's that's the main, main difference with with France at the moment is that they decided to, um, to make the restrictions a bit tighter in terms of those special events. So from the 3rd of January, you had to have 5,000 people max uh, in the stands. I think they're still thinking for certain people, and that's outside stands. So the poor uh, racing is, is going to be even lower than that. It's going to be 2,000, I think, in, yeah. their, in their stadium. Um, even though they might think of doing 50% of capacity, which would make a lot more sense so that it's not like, you know, just like a, a 5,000 for everyone, but you could depend on the size of your, of your stadium. But on top of that, yes, they have made it compulsory. I think it's a, it's a big battle of the French government to force people to get vaccinated. You had your sort of your COVID pass, and now it's your vaccination pass. You, even a, a negative test doesn't get you into uh, into nightclubs, into uh, when well, the nightclubs are shut. But you know what I mean, into all those 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 uh, places, um, and they're really pushing it. So th- that had to be implemented in in top fourteen too, to the point where they said that uh, players who are unvaccinated are no longer able to play, um, which was already something that was sort of done every time there was a positive case. You would see the guys who were non-vaccinated who would just not come at all, whether they're positive, negative, because they were too much at risk. They couldn't even be near the club. That's what happened in, in Clermont all the time with Matsushima and George Moala. Um, it's, it's, it is, there's about one or two guys for personal beliefs, and you can't blame them for anything, uh, who decide not to do it? And uh, I saw an interesting article of a what is it? Uh, Waisea uh, Naira Levou, yep. the, the the center yep. winger of Fijian for for Stade Francais, who decided to say he he just it's just his personal belief again. He doesn't believe in vaccinations, so he didn't he didn't want to do it. But now he's put into sort of a, a possibility of not being able to play. So I think if if really the things don't change, because he already had COVID, so technically he's got antibodies in him. Uh, so they're trying to play on that, or maybe just one dose would be enough. Whatever it is they're going to have to make it happen. So things are tighter. Things are a bit more complicated. Let's just hope this is the last time we need to speak about this with such such an amount of stress. Like you said, Johnny, that it's going to become a flu. We're going to have to live. If you want to get a vaccination every year for flu, well, you should do it and done. Uh, but, uh, but, rugby, but rugby went pretty tight in France and I hope it's not going to make uh, this European Cup even more complicated than it already is. And on a more positive note, on the pitch, which games are we looking forward to in particular? Benji, I know which one uh, you'll be looking forward to. I'll you'll be looking forward to Clermont Sale. That's a big one. Yeah, yeah. Clermont Sale will be will be proper. Um there's there's also there's also Toulouse going to Wasp. That will be proper because Wasp just beat Leicester, I think, for the first time, first lost in um <clears throat> for Tigers this season. I got my mate Richard Blaze. I actually spoke to, spoke to him about a French player. Ooh la la. I'm not going to tell you. He did ask me about a French player. Um, I don't think it's going to go ahead, but, but you never know. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Um, and, and so that would be exciting because tell me, correct me if I'm wrong, but was always seem to, to play a very fast paced open rugby. <clears throat> and so against Toulouse, it can be, it can be pretty hot and get pretty exciting. And I think all the teams know that, listen, anything like Zach said, they, they got 25 bonus point victory against Leinster. Anything can happen. 
over one weekend. Next week, you might, you know, be kicked out of, of, of Europe or you might be in quarterfinal or eighth or final of Europe because of some sort of circumstances. So everybody's like, whatever points there is to be taken, let's just play what there is to play full tilt. So I think everything will be a bit of live or die situation like it normally is in European, but this will maybe even more. So it'll be exciting. Uh, Lens to Montpellier, really Massive. looking forward to it. After huge. the last November tests of, of, of the Irish team, considering how many guys there are uh, that, that play for Leinster, it can only be hot. Montpellier are seriously hot at the moment. Yes, they haven't played last week, but that could help them a little bit. So now there's, there's some proper games. I mean, listen, all the games are, are... I'm just... I love European rugby and I can't wait for it to be back. There's a few that are almost formalities. Like you look at La Rochelle, Bath, Ospreys against Racing. Um, going to be one-way traffic, but really looking for, like you said, Leinster against Montpellier, like two teams packed full of talent. Um, and you just want these things to go ahead. You want to see the spectacle. You want it to be on TV. You want to be working at these games and to see a decent level European rugby, especially with the Six Nations just coming around the corner. These guys need top high-end match practice in the best competition, in my opinion, best club competition in the world. So really looking forward to those ones. Also really looking forward to Bordeaux against Lanethley. Randomly, don't know why, I've always enjoyed watching the Scarlets. Uh, so looking forward to that game in Bordeaux too. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Benji. And a big thanks to all you guys for listening as well. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review if you can as well. Check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, guys. Cheers, Cheers boys. boys. Bye.